Hello everyone and welcome to a new segment on the channel we're going to call Brew Day with Beerlay because that's right today we are not going to actually be drinking and review well we're going to be drinking beer but that's not going to be the main point of this video actually instead we're going to be making our own beer that's right so um, I'm going to walk you guys through the steps show you my setup and how kind of I do things that does not mean it's the only way or even the correct way to do stuff there's a lot of stuff that you know I make mistakes on and that's fine we're all human that's part of the fun is making mistakes and learning from those mistakes so that we can make better beer in the future. So let's get started. The very first thing you actually have to do is a few days in advance, you first have to decide, you know, what style of beer you're going to brew. I am brewing a beer for a friend's wedding and he has requested that we brew a Kulsch, it's a German style ale beer from the city of Cologne. So I have my recipe, I have all of my ingredients ordered and they have arrived. And so I think the next thing to do is to start brewing. So let's go in the kitchen, well, let's get that going. Another thing I'd recommend you guys, especially if you do this quite often, is to uh, get yourself a beer book. I've got mine here. But essentially, all it is is a, a notebook where you, you know, write down a bunch of stuff. Yeah, pretty much. If the more you write down, the more notes you make, then you know in the future what you did. So either if you do something good, you can go back and refer to it, or if you do something bad, you can be like, ah, oh, okay, that's where I made my mistake. That's where I need to change and. And do something. So um, writing things down has helped me in the past. Even on this recipe, I kind of look at stuff and see, okay, hey, what I do for this recipe, and then try and either copy that or change it up a little bit. First thing, let's heat up some water. So here's a pot of water. Here's our um, controls down here. Oh, let me. So we're actually going to heat this to 73 degrees. Boop. Push that. And so now this water's going to start heating up. So, uh, we're heating up our mash water to 73 degrees. That doesn't mean we're mashing in at 73. We're hitting for a goal of 64 degrees. These are all Celsius, of course, not um, Fahrenheit. Kolsch's are a little bit drier beers. They don't have a lot of residual sweetness in them, and the... I think Sebastian's here. It's like I was saying, um, uh, Kolsch's don't have a lot of residual sweetness, have a nice dry maltiness to them, so we're gonna go a bit lower on our mash temperature, starting at uh, 64, and then when we spar, we're gonna wrap that up. Hey Sebastian! So Sebastian's here. Say hi Sebastian. Hello. <laughs> While we're waiting for the match water to eat up, let me just go through my brewing setup and just show you guys, you know, what's uh, what's going on. So as you guys are seeing, we have a uh, kettle down here that heats up water. We're gonna have our mash ton. That's just a uh, nice easy PVC bucket right there. And then we have a hot liquor tank up in the top. Um, this isn't a very American system, not very European, mostly because this takes up quite a bit of space. If I scoop back here, you can see it pretty much takes up the entire room of my kitchen. So it's not very, not very space efficient. Um, a lot of, a lot of Europeans, they just have like a one kettle system, either brew in a bag or like a grandfather type of a thing. But yeah, I'm, I'm a, I'm a red blooded American. So I like my, I like my three tier gravity fed system. So yeah, we're still waiting for the uh, mash water to heat up. But um, once that's done, then we'll, we'll mash in and, and get this thing, get this thing going. All right. So our water is now up to temp. We're going to mash in and Sebastian's gonna help me. All right, so let's get going. So although the malt bill was shown for a very brief second earlier in the video, I feel now would be a good time to talk about the malts we're gonna be using in this beer, so let's do that. As I said at the beginning, Kulsch is a very light, low complexity beer, and therefore the malt bill is pretty simple, consisting of only pale malt. 3.22 kilograms or 82% is best Pilsner malt, which will give the beer high fermentability without adding much complexity. 430 grams or 11% is best Vienna malt. Vienna malt is highly fermentable, which will dry out the beer and also add some bright golden color and a bit of bready nutty flavorness to it. Flavorness? Did I just say flavor? And 280 grams or 7% of Weirman Carapils. I've used Carapils in a number of beers in the past and I've loved the soapy thick head which it gives the beers. And with a Kolsch, good head retention is a must. I was also gonna add some acidulated or sour malt to the grist, but decided against it after measuring the mash pH and came out within range. More on that later. Make sure we get all the dough balls out. You know about dough balls? No. So dough balls are like chunks of, so here's a dough ball. Mm -hmm. That nice. is not what you want. Do you want to get the thermometer and take a temperature reading of the mash? 64, 65, 65.9. That's 66, so we're a little high. So we're just gonna kind of stir it up here a little bit. Again, making sure everything's really nice mixed together. Let it come down a degree or two. And then we're gonna take a pH reading. So here it's saying we're at 5.6. So we're a little bit high. 
Hold on. What was that question? How will you be adjusted? How will you adjust it? That's a very cool question. You adjust that by either adding sour malt or some kind of acid. But what we're also gonna do is we're gonna wait about 10, 15 minutes. We're gonna take another pH reading because sometimes the enzymes will start working and we'll actually lower the pH over time. What do we got on the temp? So there we are, 64 degrees. 65. 65, that's fine. Let's get a cover on this guy. Let it sit there for an hour. So we're filling up our sparge water, doing a 50-50% tap distilled dilution. Gonna do 15 liters at 79 degrees Celsius. And a very important part of any brew day is to stay well hydrated. May I recommend a homebrew, for example. This being the Dipple Triple, a Belgian style triple I brewed a couple weeks ago. Not too bad. All right, so our mash is done. Been an hour. Uh, now what we're gonna do is call the um, Forlauf. Pretty much what that's gonna do is set the bed grain and filter out some of the fine particulates in the mash so that we have a nice, clean, crisp, fresh beer. So let's get going on that. Do, 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 do. So pretty much what you wanna do is just let this run nice and slowly through the false bottom on the bottom of the mash tun. And that's gonna compress, like I said, compress the grains and make sure that our wort is nice and clear. Takes a little bit while. And take your time with this. If you foil off too fast, you'll run the risk of tunneling through your grain bed, which means that you won't filter the wort as effectively. Or you can end up compacting your grain bed so much that the wort doesn't flow through it anymore at all. This is called a stuck sparge, and it's not a fun problem to deal with. So after our first run of the foil off, as you can see, it's a pretty hazy um, kind of consistency. You got some little floaty bits in there that we definitely don't want to have in our mash. Or excuse me, don't want to have in our oil kettle. And that's what we're trying to get out. Then slowly pour the wort back into the mash tun. I used a folded up piece of aluminum foil to prevent tunneling into the grain bed by dispensing the pour more evenly over the top of the bed. A simple solution if you ask me. So when you're doing the foil off, the, uh, the important thing here is just to go slowly, take your time, better to do another pitcher full of, of foil off just to get that nice clarity. So it's a nice, it's a nice medium between too fast and too slow. Just take your time with it. It's all good, man. It's all good. All right, so we're done with the four lauf. As you can see, there's no, no floaty, chunky bits in there anymore. The, um, the wort that's coming out, it's not crystal, crystal clear, but it's a hell of a lot clearer than it used to be. So we're gonna be done with the four lauf, and then we're gonna start sparging and loitering into our uh, brew kettle. All right, so we have our four lauf done. We have our sparge water all heated up and we have also acidified our sparge water to 5.2. That'll help with um, reduction of tans and stuff like that in your wort and overall just make a better beer. So here's how, the, um, here's how this works. And here's some of the benefits that you have on this system over something else like brew in the bag or grandfather or something like that. Well, actually, I don't know about grandfather. I think you can also do this on grandfather. I don't know, I've never brewed on a grandfather. You can control the sparge flow and the mash out flow, which is really, really nice. So you um, pretty much what you wanna do is you wanna have an equilibrium. You wanna have a balanced outflow of your sparge water, right? And you just wanna have like, like a nice little drizzle. You don't wanna have this gushing out. So I always like to put like a nice little like, I think they're just like filter claws. You can get these on brewing websites and stuff like that. Put it over the top. So again, just any kind of, of grains that come through won't be getting into your, your brew kettle. One of the downsides on here, and this is one of the things I'd like to fix, is that you are gonna get a little bit of hot side aeration and um, oxidation because of that. Just wanna open up the tap, just a little bit, a nice little trickle. You don't wanna have it gushing out too much. Again, you just don't wanna be blowing chunks of grain through your, uh, through your mash bed. Keep it in equilibrium. And you gotta check it every once in a while, make sure that your sparge isn't going too fast. Definitely don't wanna have it too slow because if you get a dry grain bed, then um, you're gonna get a stuck sparge. Um, so just check it, but you wanna have about an inch, maybe an inch and a half of, of, of sparge water going on top of your grain bed. All right, so we have loitered. We are just waiting on our wort to boil. And in the meantime, we can do so a couple of stuff. So grab some star sand. You can find this readily um, online. This is essentially a sanitizing solution. We need to make up a batch of this so we can start. Uh, we can sanitize all of our fermenters and whatnot, and make sure that everything is nice and clean. 
clean and sterilized. So, another thing we do while we're waiting on our wort to boil is measure out our first edition of hops. That's gonna be Perla, a nice um, German hop. Again, we're not, we're not doing any kind of crazy IPAs. We're trying to keep it simple. So we're gonna do one hop edition at the start of the boil of Perla. And then with 10 minutes left in the boil, we're gonna do Spalter Select. But um, yeah, so let's get these measured out and ready for our first hop edition. All right, so our wort's boiling. We're gonna take our hop sock and our hops that we just measured them out, put them in, stick them into our warts. All right, well, while we're waiting for our wort to boil, there's not really anything else to do other than drink another beer. So um, this one is actually a Saison or a table beer. This was brewed with the second runnings of the last beer that we had, the triple but fermented with the Kvike yeast from Norway. So it's a farmhouse, or a Norwegian farmhouse ale yeast. All right, so we're about 15 minutes to go left in the boil. We're gonna add our wort chiller. We do this to sanitize everything, because as you know, when you boil stuff, it kills stuff that is bad. Uh, at 10 minutes, we need to add our second edition of hops, so we're gonna measure that out right now as well. All right, so yeah, um, second edition of hops is Spotter Select, nice German style hop, 25 grams at, like I said, 10 minutes left in the boil. Nice, got those. We're also gonna add some Irish moss. Irish moss helps with um, the clarity of beer. It binds with proteins from the from the malts, and yeah, it just results in a little bit of a clearer beer. So we're gonna add five grams of that as well. So yeah, Irish moss is going in. Give it a nice stir. Mix it up all in there. And at ten minutes on, the nose are ready for. Our next edition of hops. So these are gonna go in the hop sock as well. Just let it sit there for another 10 minutes and we'll be ready to chill it down. All right, so we're just um, putting our sanitizer in our fermenting vessel and that timer means we are done with the boil. So we're gonna unplug the boil, or the unplug the kettle. We're gonna make some room. So the point of chilling the wort is that yeast doesn't live in hot temperatures. So we gotta take this boiling liquid at 100 degrees Celsius and we gotta cool it down to pitching temperature around 20 degrees Celsius. 25, we'll be happy with that as well. So this will probably run for about a half an hour. We're gonna get a bunch of hot water as well as, um, as a result of this. So we can use that to either clean or if you just have too much hot water, you just gotta dump it. But um, small tip, use your hot water from your cooler to clean other stuff as well. In the meantime, let's clean some stuff. So we've cooled down our wort to about, about 24 degrees, right? So that means we are ready to um, do our whirlpool. What we're gonna do is we're gonna do the whirlpool. And what that is essentially, you're agitating the wort. And what that's gonna do is it's gonna introduce some oxygen, which is gonna help with yeast growth and when you whirlpool it like this, all the kind of sediments, the proteins, the particulates that have been cooked off during the boil are going to settle directly in the center of the kettle. Then when we pour it out of the side of the kettle, then we're not gonna get as many particulates into our fermenter. So we're actually gonna get a cleaner beer at the end. We're gonna let that sit there for about 15 minutes or so. So here's the yeast that we're gonna use. I think I already showed you guys this. It's a cloche, a cloche yeast. That's the right word, isn't it, Sebastian? A cloche Fish. yeast, a cloche yeast. Um, and here, look at the package. Sometimes you have to hydrate yeast, sometimes you have to do a starter, depending on what it says on the package. This package says we have to rehydrate, so it's saying that we're gonna take 100 milliliters of water, we gotta sprinkle the yeast in there, we gotta stir briefly, and then let it sit. Sprinkler on top. So ladies and gentlemen, our whirlpool has finished. We should hopefully have a nice clear wort. I have a sanitized fermentation vessel underneath my kettle. 
I've got a nice sanitized line going down. And so now what we're going to do is just open this slowly. And we're just going to let the, um, the wort trickle out into the fermentation chamber. I like to do it this way for a couple of reasons. The main one is just because with the splashing, you're actually going to oxygenate the wort. You also want to do it slowly, not too fast, because like I said, we did the whirlpool to kind of coagulate all of those sediments, all those particulates into the middle of the kettle. And if we just open up the valve as hard as we can, then it's just going to suck all those sediments out. So you just want to do it nice and slow. And then once we finish up filling this thing up, we're going to give it another good shape to oxygenate it even more. Pitch our yeast and then we should be good to go. All right. So we're coming down to the end. Trying just to get the last bits of wort out of there without uh, getting too much of the sediment and proteins and whatnot into our fermenter. All right, so we have a sanitized funnel and we're just going to carefully pour our yeast. Take our cap and our airlock, both sanitized of course. Affix them top of the fermenter. Now is that. We are done brewing for today. We're gonna let this thing sit and ferment for about seven to ten days come back and um see how it's doing so then i actually got this beer cooled down to about 17 sometimes 16 degrees by wrapping the fermenter in a wet t-shirt to kind of wick away some of that heat as kolsch's are usually fermented at a little bit lower temperature than a normal ale yeast this meant however that it actually took a little bit longer than the seven to ten days that i intended this beer to ferment for i actually ended up bottling 16 days after I brewed it. Now this yeast that I used, it was just a really kind of a slow burner. There wasn't a lot of like really high activity. The Croizen wasn't really super, super big and fluffy like you might expect on, on some other styles of beer. As you can see here, it only really got to about a half an inch to an inch on the top of the wort. In the airlock, while it was a steady bubbling away, it wasn't super high crazy activity. And this actually kind of set the pace for this beer, which I'll come back to. But first, let's actually try this beer out. I have it here, nicely labeled and everything. So, um, get a glass. And, um, yeah. <laughs> so, because of my procrastination of actually recording this last part of the video, and with COVID being it is what it is, and having nothing else to do but drink some beers and my excitement for actually trying to taste this beer and the fact that I gave quite a bit of away because of, you know, it was brewed for a friend's wedding. I actually don't have any more bottles left to try on camera, but regardless, I can still give you guys kind of my opinions of the beers that I drank and some improvements for the future. The biggest one being the fact that it was just a slow fermenting beer. The first bottles I tried after about two weeks after they were bottled, they were sweet low on carbonation, had a very kind of grainy, green vegetable-y bitterness to them. While they weren't ruined or infected or anything like that, it was just not a very well-rounded and that crisp, clean beer that I was expecting. It was also a little bit hazy despite all the measures I took during the brew day to clear that beer up. After about two months after the brew day, I was down to my last two or three bottles and they were actually really nice beers. The vegetableiness kind of went away, the sweetness as well. There was good carbonation, good head retention, and really good clarity also when the beers were chilled. I also had a couple of friends try them, including one who's also a homebrewer friend of mine whose technical opinion I really highly value, and he said it was one of the best beers that I've ever brewed. So I guess the biggest change that I would make to this beer is not drink it too early. I've done this a couple of times with other beers in the past. I guess you would think I would learn from my mistakes. However, sometimes beers just need time to mature, especially when they're bottle conditioned. And the beer can actually turn into a really nice beer two, three, or even four months later after it's been bottled. But despite my impatience, I am pretty, pretty happy with the results. But yeah, some beers just need a little bit more time before they're ready to drink. Other beers don't need time, including the next beer that I'm gonna brew and make a video on. So you guys should stay tuned for that because that's going to be coming up hopefully quicker than this video got released. Regardless, I hope you guys liked this video. If you did, give it a thumbs up, comment below if you want to see other stuff in the future or if you have any questions or anything. Feel free to subscribe to my channel as well and don't forget to support common sense gun control legislation. Until next time, I'll see you guys on Beer Lake. Cheers.